Last time we were talking about RNA secondary structure and um, I mentioned uh, a lot about the, in sort of a hand-waving way, the biological background of this problem, but ultimately it boils down to the following thing. We have a string. It's using four letters, or an alphabet of four letters, A, T, C, G. And uh, we're permitted to pair pairs of A and U, and C and G are permitted. Um, but we have uh, four conditions. Well, this is part of them. Uh, we have four conditions that, that have to hold in getting a secondary structure. Um, one, I don't remember what the order in which I did this last time, although this time I brought notes. So I think these, this um, is what's used in the book. I less than J minus 4. So pairs of AU are permitted in positions I and J. So IJ pair, but this is one condition that has to hold, that there has to be at least four positions between I and J. Okay, they can't be neighbors, they can't be too close. Uh, so that's one condition. The second condition is actually what was written up here. Uh, only A can pair with U, and conversely, and C can pair with G. Okay. Third condition is that uh, the pairing has to be a matching. Pairing forms a matching. And what that means is that each position is involved in at most one pair. So a position is in at most one pair. Um, and then the most important one, most important condition put here for um, if ij, and I think last time I said i prime, j prime, are pairs, are paired, or matched in the secondary structure, then i less than i prime less than uh, j less than j prime is prohibited. Prohibited. Okay. And what, that, what does that look like? This is i, i prime, j, j prime. If, if the indices have that relation, if i is, is matched to j and i prime is matched to j prime, then you have a crossover there. And so what this is saying is that you're not permitted any crossovers. So we had pictures of a secondary structure last time that had this sort of picture, OK? Something like that showed the actual pairings or the matching that was prohibited, that was permitted. So we can now make up a, um, a sequence. If this is A, what's this one? That's U, right? AU. Um, and if this is a C, this one over here is a G. And if this is a G, this is a C, and et cetera. OK. C, G, and have I done? Yeah, I guess it, that's a, what happened? That's a G, that's a G. This is, let's say, a U. That's an A. And this is a C, G. So in that sequence, this is a permitted, oops, is this a permitted secondary structure? No. Why? Yeah. 
Right, right, right. Okay. Um, this condition, which I last time said was kind of a nuisance, at least in terms of the algorithmic problem, but does mirror the biology in, uh, appropriately, that wouldn't, um, that would for, that would prohibit C for matching. It would prohibit a lot of these things. So we'll just put a lot of A's inside here, okay, and put a lot of uh, U's inside here or whatever. And now this sequence would allow this secondary structure. Okay, and the problem is with all these conditions, we want to find a secondary structure that maximizes the number of these pairings. Because each pairing in the actual folding of the molecule represents um, a bond. And the more bonds you have, the more stable the structure is, the more, um, even in two dimensions, uh, the, the num well, you're seeing the number of bonds there uh, in two-dimensional representation. Maybe in three dimensions you get some additional ones, I don't know. But even in two dimensions, if you have a large number of bonds, that's, uh, at, at least at, at the way this, was first, this problem was first modeled, that was believed to be uh, one of the more likely folds or secondary structures uh, for the RNA. And that actually, I, I believe, I'm, I'm not a I'm not a molecular biologist, but, um, and I didn't even stay at Howard Johnson's last night or whatever that, however that ad goes. Uh, but um, anyway, I think this has been relatively successful, at least at the beginning of this investigation into RNA secondary structure to have this model. Okay, but just purely back to the algorithmic question, how do we maximize problem given a string, a sequence, whatever you want to call it, we want to find a secondary structure to maximize the number of pairs. Okay? So as I said last time, we have several algorithmic strategies we've looked at. We've looked at divide and conquer. Um, it's possible there's a divide and conquer approach here, but uh, it, it seems pretty involved if there was one. Uh, greedy algorithms. We thought a little bit about greedy algorithms last lecture, and I said no greedy algorithm that I know of actually works, and you can think of various greedy algorithms you know, matching a character to its closest permitted uh, complement or to its farthest permitted complement or whatever, uh, those, the, you can find examples where they fail to find the maximum. So what we have left and what we're talking about in general right now is dynamic programming. So dynamic programming, well in dynamic programming the first thing you do is you invent notation that's related to a recurrence. So it's sort of circular because you have to have the recurrence in mind to get good notation and you have to have good notation to express your recurrence. And so this is sort of the, where the most creative part comes in. You just have to play with various uh, recursive ideas until you hit on one that seems uh, likely to succeed and then you have to do the analysis and the details and see if you're right. So here's one that people have found uh, for this problem, opt ij is defined as, this is, this is really a definition, this is defined as the secondary structure that maximizes the number of pairs Well, under the condition, we restrict uh, attention to, to the sub-interval, the sub-sequence between i and j. So you have a long 
RNA molecule between positions 1 and N, and subproblems of interest that we're going to restrict our attention to are the ones that occur between a position I and a position J. So it, it may, be, may not be clear why we're picking this kind of substructure, but it should be clear this is a sub problem because I and J, well, I, I should have said, of course, I is greater than or equal to 1 and J is less than or equal to N. They're in the re proper range and I is less than J. Well, for technical reasons, we're going to have the possibility of equal. It doesn't really make sense the way I just wrote it like that. So we're looking at, at different subintervals. And with this notation, with this notation, what is the, um, what is the problem we're trying to find or trying to solve? What's the ultimate problem we're trying to then solve? Anybody on that side? Yes. Yeah, we've, we ultimately would like to find opt between 1 and n because that's everything. OK? Now, the previous problem we looked at had just a single parameter. The previous problem was the interval question. And there was only a single parameter, which was you can consider uh, intervals between 1 and j, and then you increase j all the way to n. Here we have two parameters. Okay. It's not clear why we need two parameters. Why don't we just have one? What if I just invented opt of j again is the optimal solution, the best solution, the best folding or secondary structure um, between 1 and j, and then opt of n would be what we wanted. Okay? And so why do I have two parameters instead of one? Right, good answer. Because nobody knows how to, how to do a recursive solution uh, to this problem with just a single parameter. Okay, it's just if you find one, I mean, as I say, do you invent the notation related to the recurrence you have in mind, and the recursions that people have thought of for this problem all involve intervals, arbitrary intervals in here, as opposed to intervals that are only starting at position one and going to various positions in here. So you could invent the notation opt j. It's just that when you try to go to the recurrence for that, you might get stuck, because so far everybody has with just a single parameter. Um, but two parameters has worked. OK. So this is why I say this is the most creative part. And to some extent, it's hard to teach. It's hard to say how people came up with this, except just to show you. And then once you see enough of these examples and try some, you, you start to get good at it yourself. OK, opt of j, ij has this meaning. And so now we want a, uh, a recurrence for opt ij. Well, actually, here, people have come up with a lot of different alternative recurrences. And some are better in some uh, aspects than others. But let me follow the ones that are in the book. Uh, so opt ij, um, well, first of all, we need the base case. OK, so what happens if i and j are too close? Because we have this condition over here that they have to have at least four characters in between. OK, so if they're too close, and we're trying to maximize here, we're trying to get as many pairs as possible. If i and j are too close, then what should opt ij be? Hmm? Zero, right. So opt ij equals 0, and this is if i is greater than or equal to j minus 4. OK. That seems a little funny, right? Um, what do we have over here? We had i was less than, yeah, i is required to be less than j minus 4. So yeah, the opposite is, is i. I guess that makes sense. i greater than or equal to j minus 4. Why this seems a little funny to me is because this even allows i to be bigger than j. But technically, that's fine. We, I mean, we wanted i to be less than j. Okay, So 
if we say uh, technically when i is bigger than j, then uh, definitely that should be 0. And actually, in the recurrence, I think it'll be useful, you'll see in a minute, to, uh, to have included one of those cases where i is actually bigger. OK, so that's, that's your base case. And then the general case, opt i j, well, always when you're inventing the recurrences, you're thinking recursively about the problem. In this case, it's i through j. And you think about how, how does it relate to smaller instances, subproblems, with a, sort of a kind of case analysis. Something happens or something doesn't happen. And this is why I said there's, there are actually many ways of writing these recurrences. People have come up with different ones. But um, here is, uh, is one. Um, we look at, at the character in position j, and there are two possibilities for that character. Either that's used in, in a pair, okay, or it's not. Okay, the character that's in position j may or may not be used, and that does cover all the cases. So if it's not used in position, if it's not used in the match, then what is the best thing that you can do using characters between i and j? If you're not going to use the character in position j, what's the best you can do? Hmm? Yeah, you can use the characters between i and j minus 1 in the best possible way. And, and what's the notation for that, or for that value? Yeah. Right, opt of i minus, to j minus 1. So this is one possibility, opt of i to j minus 1. So this is, the, this is the best possible value you can get. OK, so I, I guess I, I did, didn't emphasize one thing. Opt ij, secondary structure that maximum. This is actually the value of. OK, so this is a number, not an actual secondary structure. And that's very typical of, of dynamic programming. Your, your recurrences are talking about values or costs. And then later through traceback, you'll actually find the uh, actual description of the solution that gives you that value. So opt ij is equal to the best you can do if you just use characters between i and j minus 1. OK? Well, the other possibility is that the other possibility is that j is going to be used in some pair. And what does it pair with? Some, the character in some position. Let's say it's position t. OK? So you get 1 for that pairing. OK? Um, for that pair, the pair of j to t. And then having made that pair, and we'll have to put some conditions. What are the conditions on t, by the way? It's what? It has to be far enough away. And what's the other condition? Yeah. It has to be the type that matches. Right. The, the characters in position T and J have got to be complementary. They have to be one of those two pairs that are permitted. OK? So we'll, we'll write that in a minute. But assuming that you can actually pair J with T, then if that's going to be part of the solution, if that's going to be part of the secondary structure, What's the rest of the secondary structure look like? You're not permitted to, to, to cross this, OK? You can't have a pairing that, that starts over here somewhere and ends in there. That's, that's not permitted, OK? You also can't have a pairing that starts over here and goes to J, because J is only permitted to match to be in one pair, right? And you can't have a pairing that goes from here beyond j because we're only looking at the interval between i and j. So if, if j is going to pair with t, then what else do we know? Or what else can we say about the rest of the, of the uh, secondary structure? Yeah? Well, anything that's between i and t minus 1 would be OK. So we can put in off i and t minus 
Right. So something in here, and what else? Yeah. Okay, this is very messy. So I'll put it over here. It's 1, that's for the, uh, it's the j through t. Then we have opt of 1 through t minus 1 plus opt of t plus 1 through j minus 1. So we, I'm going to redraw this. This is just really messy. So if you have j matching t, then the only things you can have left over, you can have a, a match, a, a secondary structure, a permitted secondary structure between i and t minus 1. And you want to have the best possible one, the one that, that uh, maximizes the number of pairs in that range. And you can have one from t plus 1 through j minus 1. And you want to have the best one that you can have there. So you get one for the tj match, and then you do the best in here and the best in here. And then, of course, this is only if, if um, the characters in positions uh, t and j can pair. Okay, and can pair means they're far enough apart and they're complementary characters. I'm not going to write that down. Okay, well, what is t? I said it just, you know, j, the character in position j is going to match the character in position t, and then we're going to have these two subproblems. But which t do you take? Yeah. Uh, the leftmost t that's permitted? Okay, you might think that um, that's, a, that's a possible strategy. I think when you play with examples, you'll find that that doesn't always work. Okay, that that's, if you use that rule, you can run into examples where you won't, in the end, get the best possible secondary structure. Any other suggestions? Yeah. The rightmost, right okay. Uh, no, that won't be any better. What about the middlemost? Uh, that won't be any better. Okay, what's left? What's left is everything. Okay, you've got to try them all. You have to maximize your choice. I've got too many brackets here. That, that, this, this, that. Maximize over t. t is less than... Um, j minus 4, right? And greater than or equal, or greater than i. Let's try that. Oh, uh, no, we want to permit i. Yeah, it's, it's possible that, that j matches i. Okay, that's, that's possible. That's, that's the pairing. And so we have, to, we have to allow that. So this is saying... Inside this part, you want to look at all possible t's in the right range. And of course, you're only going to consider those t's that can pair. But for each one of those that can pair, you get a 1 for that pairing. And then you get the best from the, the two subproblems. Okay. So this is when j doesn't match. This first term is when j is not in any pairing, any pair. This is when j isn't a pair, a permitted pair with t. And you have to explicitly consider all t's that are, that are in the right range. And so you want to look at the two of these. And what do you want to do between the, this one option and the max of these various options? What do you want to do? Yeah. Yeah, pick the big, biggest. So there's a max here also. So this is a bracket that matches with that one, and then we here, here's a parenthesis that matches with this parenthesis. Okay. 
I suppose you could have just had a single max out here, and you know, but this is the way it's written in the book. And so it's the max of this option and the max of these options. And uh, when you've done that, that tells you what opt ij is. Okay? So this recurrence considers all... Um, it, 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 it's, you, can convince, you should be able to convince yourself that, that the recurrence is right because it considers all possibilities. Either J is not in any pair in that interval, or it is, in which case it's matched to some, it's in a pair with some T, and of course that, has, that position T or the characters there have got to be allowed. And when you do that, then you have two sub-problems, one inside here and one inside there. And we're considering explicitly all possible T, so everything is covered. You really have you've considered all the possibilities, so it's explicit here. This recurrence looks right. Yeah. Yes. Right. Sorry. Yeah. That, that's an I to T minus one. And this is a J. Yeah. OK. So the correctness is clear. Uh, you could you know, write an inductive proof to, to even be in more formal about it, but it's, it's pretty clear this is right. Now, the second issue in, in dynamic programming, once you have the recurrence relation, is how you're going to evaluate it. What's the order in which? you're going to actually fill in these values, find these values. Okay, so now we have opt parameterized by two parameters. So we now need a two-dimensional table, not just a one-dimensional table. So we'll have that. And to find an ordering, when I say how do you want to solve it, it means what's the order in which you're going to look at the ij? How are you going to vary those uh, values from i to i and j? And the answer to that is that um, or there can be many answers, but the answer has to satisfy the recurrences. You have to, uh, if you come up with a scheme for how you're going to vary i and j, you have to, that scheme has to satisfy the property that whenever you want to solve opt ij with the recurrence, you have available already the, uh, the values that are called for in the recurrence. You have to have opt ij minus 1 already computed. And you have to have opt i t minus 1 in the proper range and t plus 1 through j minus 1 in the proper range already computed. So those, that's your constraint. So how do you, um, you, you can think of various uh, possibilities. You know, if I do like this, for example, for i equals 1 to uh, n minus I don't know, four, for j equals i uh, plus four to n, whatever. Yeah, that's, is that going to work? Uh, compute opt ij. Okay. So if we're looking at, um, here's i, here's j, this is the op table. This, these things really are annoying. I'm just going to get rid of them. Okay, so if i and j are too close, then the recurrence will tell you, forget it. Okay, but certainly we're running through all values of i and j here, right? Well, all the values where i is is less than or equal to j. Okay. So we're certainly running through all the relevant values. But at the moment where I want to compute opt ij, if I do it in this, in this order, is it going to work? Well, you look over here at the recurrence, okay, and this says you need opt of i j minus 1. Do you have the opt of i j minus 1 at that moment? i is running from, from 1 to n, and j is running from i up through n. Okay, so the moment when you wanted 
ij, you have already looked at ij minus 1. So that seems OK. At the moment when you want uh, ij, opt ij, you can get opt ij minus 1. You can just look it up. It's already been computed. Uh, what about this one? OK, opt i, t minus 1. What's the relationship of t minus 1 to j? It's less. So this is also available or unavailable? Available. It's available. And what about this one? This is opt of t plus 1 through j minus 1. What's the relationship of t plus 1 to i? It's bigger, right? So when you want to compute opt ij, is this available or not? It's not available, OK? If, if, we're, using that, if we're using that ordering of the ij variables, or ij indices, at this moment, you're trying to, if you're trying to evaluate this recurrence by, by looking um, for ij, it tells you you should look up what opt of t plus 1, j minus 1 is. And you don't have it. In, in the bottom-up dynamic programming approach. If you're doing a top-down, this is fine, but we've already skipped over that. We don't want to do top-down. That would be tremendously inefficient. So this ordering isn't going to work. But everybody understand what I mean now by ordering? How are you going to, in what order of the ij parameters are you going to evaluate opt ij? So anybody have any other suggestions? The distance between i and j should increment. Yes, that's exactly right. That will work. So we want to look at all values of i and j that are, let's say, 1 away, where i and j are 1 away. Well, of course, the lows will all be 0. Then 2 away, then 3 away, then 4 away. So i and j, the distance between them is increasing. And then you see when you want to evaluate uh, opt of ij for these two parameters, well, this distance between i and j minus 1 is less than the distance between i and j. And this is less than i and j. And this is less than the distance between i and j. So these should all be available. And so that should work. Well, let me write this down in some pseudocode. It might be a little clearer if you, don't, if you haven't seen the idea yet. Um, well, we're assuming the base case. Well, OK. So opt ij equals 0 for i greater than or equal to j minus 4. And then for k equals 5 through n minus 1, for i equals 1 through n minus k, j equals i plus k, and then you compute opt ij using the recurrence. So whatever. And then you can return opt 1 through n, ultimately. OK? So that you may want to parse this a little bit. This is exactly what's in the book, so if you, don't, you don't need to really write it down right now. But this is just saying we're going to look at the values of i and j in increasing distance between i and j initially. And, and the distance parameter here is, is k. k is the distance between i and j that's being used. So uh, i is going to range from 1 through n minus k. And, um, and j is going to be i plus k. That's the distance away from it. n minus k. Yeah, I mean, that's right. OK, so you're looking at all those distances, uh, all the distances between i and j in these two, anyway, in this pseudocode. OK, so you could evaluate opt ij by using this organization. Um, there are other ways of, of, of doing it. This looking at distances between 
uh, INJ is sort of the one that's, that's, I guess, the first one that was successful that people looked at. And uh, that's the one you'll find in all the textbooks on RNA folding or secondary structure. It actually turns out there's a way of, of organizing that, that looks more natural, where you can actually have I and J uh, incrementing in a more regular way and, and not in this distance between them. And maybe I'll try to cook up a homework question uh, for you to discover that organization. But the first organization we looked at didn't work. This one does work, and this is the one that, that's, uh, well, that's well known. Now, if you look at the, uh, if you look at the table uh, and you're trying to sort of draw in the order in which um, these recurrences are being evaluated, these values are being evaluated, it looks like you're going along on the off diagonal. Okay, so this is where an I equals J, and this is where uh, J is one bigger than I. This is where J is two bigger than I, three bigger than I, four bigger than I. Well, according to the, this, all of these would be zero until you got out here. Of course, my scale here is very bad because most of the action is happening there, which I left little, very little room for. But uh, generally, that's a large part. But the point is that according to the way these, are, uh, these loops are, are set, you're going to be filling in the values along here, and then the next one is going to be along there, and, and so on. Okay. So if you're having trouble visualizing what's going on here, just think about it going that way. Okay, now we can ask, uh, so now we have a correct set of recurrences. We have a way of evaluating them that, that looks correct. What's the um, time complexity? What, how much time does this... Uh, does it take to evaluate all the, rec all the values, that is to fill in this table and finally return opt of 1n? Okay. Well, you can do the analysis by just looking at the pseudocode, right? Okay. So you have two loops here. Each one goes through at most n times. In fact, well, they both go less than n times, but uh, well, th this one goes less than n times, and each time this is entered, this goes less than n times. But you can think of this as going n times, and this is going n times inside of that. Okay, and then, so how many times does this compute statement get reached? At most n squared. You've got an n on the outer, n on the inner, that's at most n squared. And then when you're actually computing opt of ij, you're doing that by using the recurrence here, and how many operations are involved in computing opt ij? At most, what? N. n. Who said n? N. Yeah, at most n, because uh, you have to look at every t in the proper range. You're looking at t's in the proper range. The range is at most n. That's the biggest uh, size of the range. And for, for any fixed j and t, you're looking this up. That's one operation. You're looking this up. That's two. You're adding them. That's three. Um, you're, you're making sure that they're permitted to be matched. Maybe you should do that first. But anyway, that's a handful of operations. That's constant. You're looking this up. That's another operation. You're comparing these two. That's another operation. So it's a constant number of operations for any um, I, J, a constant number of operations, sorry, uh, for uh, every J and T, constant number for J and T, and the number of uh, T's that you have to consider is bounded by N. And then finally, when you found that max, you compare it to this, so that's another uh, additional small number, two. So overall, when you evaluate opt ij, how many operations can we bound? What bound should we use for the number of operations? I see your mouth move. <laughs> what? Oh, okay, but the n cubed is, is the next question. Inside here, how much is it? Right, inside here, this is just n. 
So for a fixed ij, it's bounded by n, or order n, but uh, n. And outside here, we have n squared. So this, this is something inside of here is big O of n. n squared, squared around it means that the total time total time for this dp is big O of n cubed. OK? And so this is the classic um, dynamic programming solution for this problem of RNA secondary structure. And its running time is big O of n cubed. OK, and as I said, I'll, I'll try um, on, on some future homework to get you to discover a different way of organizing this computation that may seem a little bit more natural. Um, OK, so we've gone through um, three components of the dynamic programming. One is finding recurrences. The second is figuring out how we're going to evaluate them. Um, when you do the evaluation, you tableize them. You put them in the table like this. We now know what it's, uh, the worst case running time is for doing that tableizing, evaluating all the uh, uh, the values. What's left in dynamic programming typically? Hmm? Yeah, understanding how to do the traceback. Okay, and uh, the book actually doesn't um, give you any details of that. It just says, oh, and you can do the traceback in sort of the standard way. It only gave you one example of traceback so far, which was on the interval problems. Uh, so I think it's, it's worthwhile um, thinking a little bit about how to do the traceback here. And let's just do it, um, well, you can do it in two ways. One is the way the book presented it, which traceback generally, which is by following some algorithm. And the algorithm is going to have built into it the logic of the recurrences. But it's going to end up doing comparisons that you did anyway during your forward computation. By forward computation, I mean uh, the computation you were doing when you filled in the table. This is the forward computation. You're filling in the table. And for every ij, you already know where the best value for opt ij comes from, or who, who was the winner in, the, um, in this recursion for op, opt ij. You know whether it was from this case or from this case. And if it's from this case, you know what the t was. There might be ties, but anyway, you know, you know uh, one winner, one that was just as good as any other. And so uh, to do a traceback, you could go through these kinds of recurrences again. Uh, or you could have left pointers when we did the forward computation. And then on the traceback, you just have to follow the pointers appropriately. Well, I guess we might want to do both of those, at least informally. So. Having filled in the op table, uh, here's 1, here's n. OK, so you finally have opt 1n sitting there. OK. And you can ask, well, how did I get there? What was the last action in the forward computation that got me there? Well, you were filling in opt 1n. And for that, you looked at opt 1n minus 1. Or you considered all the values of t that would have paired with the character in position n. And you, um, you did this. And so who is the winner? If, if the winner was this, uh, one, uh, 1 through n minus 1, then I guess you just, well, let's just uh, record this. Then if who was, where did the winner come from? It was um, opt of 1, n minus 1. So if you've recorded that there, in addition to the value, uh, I guess I shouldn't say, I just say this is the winner. It came from 1, n minus 1. So it's just saying the optimal to get the opt of 1 through n, the winner there was to use this case.
from 1 through n minus 1. So let's say we've recorded that there. What would the traceback do at this moment with this piece of information? We're trying to find the, the actual optimal solution, the optimal um, secondary structure. And if we had recorded that the, that the winning part of the recurrence was this at the very last step, what does that mean in terms of the, of the actual secondary structure? Yeah. Yes, we'll want to do that, but more in addition to that, what else do we know? Yeah. Yeah, we're going to, we first know that tells us that the character in position n is not going to be part of the optimal secondary structure, and that in order to find the optimal sec secondary structure, we need to go over to um, 1 through n minus 1 and figure out what, what's going on there. So you can think of this as a pointer if you want that way. Now, that's if that was the winner. Now, the other possibility is that when we were filling in the table, the winner was, was that n matches with t. OK? Matches with some position t. And if that's what's recorded there, and it's not, um, it's not the n minus 1 position, um, then what, how would we use that piece of information in doing the traceback? Well, yeah. In addition to what? Yeah. N what? N and one. N and one. No. N and T. So this is saying that uh, the character in position N matches the character, is paired with the character in position T. So we know that's part, that's a little piece of what the um, optimal secondary structure looks like. We know that at this point. And then what was stated is, is correct. We would then have to recurse on looking for what was the optimal between um, 1 and t minus 1. So we'd look in that position, 1, whatever t happens to be. So it would be here, through t minus, 1 through t minus 1. We'd look in there. And we would have to look also at t plus 1 uh, n minus 1. So wherever t is, let's say that's there, t minus 1, n minus 1. So we'd have to look in there, OK? So we'd end up um, knowing a little bit about what the secondary structure should look like. N matches with T. And then we have two sub-problems that we have to look into. And the logic inside each one of these cells is exactly the same as what I did here. Once you look in here, you're going to see what was recorded there. And that's going to tell you a little bit more of what the optimal secondary structure looks like, and so on. Now, in this traceback, now you, when, you could be recursing two, two different ways. So it may not be as clear as when we were looking at the interval problem that the time complexity for doing the traceback is efficient. Okay? So w the forward was n cubed. The backwards, we certainly don't want to be any more than n cubed. But actually, if you, if you think about it, we'll try to do this next, or, or maybe I'll make it on a homework. Uh, when you think about the actual time that's going on, in doing the traceback, you'll see that it's actually less than n cubed. And um, so the traceback is fairly uh, is efficient as well. And so you could do the traceback by explicitly going through these recurrences backwards the way we were just laying it out, or you could have left pointers. And that's sort of the way I've been thinking about it here. Okay, Pointers when you're going forward. In this case, well, this is actually a notation, a shorthand for two different pointers. Okay. Uh